going to be taking a few moments now just in remembrance of Quentin. Um, Mitch Hessian is going to be reading, most of you in Core 100 have written an expectation letter. Carrie Williams found Quentin's expectation letter. Mitch is going to read that. And then afterwards, we're going to introduce uh, Quentin's mom and dad. And then uh, Coach Smith is going to pray. Uh, Sam Tomlin is going to introduce him. So let's uh, welcome Mitch as he comes to read. My spiritual expectations are what drive me the most. I expect to grow a lot in my faith in the next four years, and that is the main reason I chose this university. Surrounding myself with Christ-like friends and professors is one of the best ways I can think to do that. My only real personal expectations are to compete and do my best in track here at SAU. My expectations for my grades are not that great. I'm not that smart when it comes to school, and I have serious trouble staying organized. This has already become a serious problem this semester with having different classes each day and having to buy my books but not knowing what books I need for each class. I came to SAU flying blind. I honestly still don't really know what's going on. I have to keep my GPA above a 3.5 to keep my scholarship or bye bye SAU. But I'm going to try with all my might to stay here. I want to get smarter when it comes to Christ. That's all I really came here wanting to learn about to be honest. I want to be able to answer virtually any question a budding Christian could ask. I want to be able to teach people properly, and that's what I expect to learn here. Some concerns I have are like what I said before about losing my scholarship, but I also sometimes fear that it's pointless that I'm even here. I'm spending thousands of dollars a year for my education when there are others who can't even feed themselves. Why can't I just go out and dedicate 100% of my life to serving others right now? I could save time and money and just go now. It's kind of dumb to me to think that because God has moved mountains for me to be here. But it's still a lingering thought I have. So overall, I'm pretty much here just to better equip myself to do God's work in the world. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Pastor Bill Greiner. Um, he's here with his wife, Robin, um, and the rest of their family. Uh, he's the senior pastor at Eagle Ridge Church of God in Midland, Michigan. Um, and as Ron said, he uh, is the father to uh, one of my best friends and teammates and roommate, uh, Quentin Greiner, uh, who, who we know lost his life this, this summer in a, in a car accident. Um, but uh, any father who, who has um, helped raise the life and, and pour into the life of a kid who was just on fire for Christ, and had one of the strongest faiths I've ever seen. Definitely has a message for us today that is worth listening to um, and thinking about. Um, so please just welcome the Griner family as uh, Coach Smith prays for him. As we usually do, I'm going to invite Bill and his wife Robin to stand down here. Let's stand for worship and prayer. And I'd like to invite whoever would like to come down front Lay hands upon our speaker and his wife. Gather in for prayer, and then Coach will pray in a minute. I, lift, I invite everybody to lift up your voices in prayer, and then Coach will pray. Everyone pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this incredible opportunity we have to come together this morning to hear the words that you have put on the heart of Bill Greiner, to share words that you have been leading and guiding him to bring to us this morning. We pray for healing. We pray for unity. Lord, we pray that you use Pastor Bill in powerful ways right now. We pray, Lord, for each of our hearts and minds to be open to hear what you have to say to us this morning. Not only that we would hear it, but that we'd be willing to do it and follow what you lead us to do. 
what you speak to us. Lord, be glorified and magnified and thank you so much. For Quentin and the gift that he was to our community, to our family, to our track team, to our campus, to the Griner family, to the Midland family, to the Warner Camp family, to the National Guard. Thank you for the gift that he has been to all of us. And thank you that we get to join him in paradise once again. Please use Bill greatly in this time and help us to be attentive and alert and responsive to your word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun
of your amazing grace that we are set free. It's because of your amazing grace that 
we know that joy and that freedom. God, we love you. Amen. Good morning. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, thank you for, for your wonderful welcome. It's great to see the, the athletes sitting up front and I really appreciate you being here. Um, I, I believe that uh, as I was finalizing some things this morning, I, I looked in at, at what I had and I said, uh, you know, it looks like a pile of rocks but I'm asking God to make it into bread. That you can feed upon and be nourished and be blessed. I wanna first begin with an asterisk. You know, the definition of an asterisk is something has been omitted that they don't want you to see. Like in those commercials that, that sell like different kind of medicines where at the end the asterisk is the, the low, quick voice that's saying, you know, could cause you to grow a third ear or think your dog is speaking to you in Spanish. You know, that, that, that's the asterisk. That's the part they admit that they don't want you to know. And, uh, um, you know, my, my asterisk uh, and my small print is that today is Quentin's fault. He got me into this. And uh, then he got to go on to his reward, and, and now I'm going to uh, do something really frightening and exciting, and that's bring God's word and bring a message to you guys. Um, I don't know whether your parents ever uh, tricked you, and you know, when, when, the, when mail came, actually when we sent actual physical mail, I know that that's foreign to you. There, there, were, there used to be mailboxes where actual mail came to. And... Uh, uh, maybe your, you know, a, a parent would give you, oh, occupant, here you go. <laughs> that's for you. Cart sort, that's for you, and, and gave you something uh, that said, you know, everyone is a, you're a finalist. Uh, and then again, the, the asterisk or the small print is that, uh, and then you read at the bottom and it says, um, you know, you, uh, everyone is a finalist, you dope, and now give us your contact information so that we can sell it to people and bilk you for everything you've got. That's the, the asterisk at the end. That's the part that's omitted. Um, my other asterisk is that I'm a pastor. I've never spoken before in front of a campus. Uh, so be gentle with me. Fake laughs are appreciated. And if you want to do this kind of, hmm, like you're really interested, uh, Quentin slept through many of my sermons on the, <laughs> on the front row. Um, I'll also make a one confession. Just I get a purge and, and then move on. My one confession is that um, during my senior year at Anderson uh, University, actually it was Anderson College, it grew up and now is a university. But my senior year, I may have found a loophole that made it appear that I was at all the chapels that I wasn't. That might have happened. Um, so, but don't judge me, because that was a long time ago. I don't think there's a, I think there's a statute of limitations. I don't think they can revoke my degree at this point. I think the, you know, water is, is gone under that bridge. But I don't know how much you want to be here today. I don't, I don't know. Quentin loved chapel. You sing like you love chapel. But not only that, I don't know how much you want to be here at Spring Arbor. I don't, I don't, I can't, I can't judge that for you. You know that. The question is, however long you're gonna be here, are you gonna be fully present? Are you gonna be thinking what's happening next? You know that guy or that, that gal who, when you're talking to them, they're really kind of looking over your shoulder for the next, someone more interesting. 
or they're always ready to, to check their phone because who might be calling, texting, or, or messaging, or whatever, might be an upgrade from you. You know what I'm saying? They're looking for the, the next thing, or that, that person that you, you ask them to hang out, and it's, um, they're kind of holding off because, you know, a, a better offer might come. That's not being fully present to right now to what God wants to say to you. Today is a great opportunity. Your time at Spring Arbor is a great opportunity. How much you want to be here will affect how you treat this place and this opportunity. When, when the boys were little, um, and, and Josiah and Dietrich are here, uh, but particularly when Quentin and Josiah were, were little, it was my job, duh, to, to when we were traveling or somewhere, to take them into a public restroom. That was just a nightmare. I mean, when they were little, that was just a, a train wreck. That was like a science experiment gone wrong, a grease fire in the kitchen. It was just bad. And, and I would say to them, okay, let's, let's go through this. You don't touch anything, all right? <laughs> you don't touch anything. You know, you don't, you know, okay, I got some dirt on my shirt. I'm going to wash it off in the urinal. No, you don't do that. Don't touch anything. We're going to go in, use it, and get out unscathed. Sometimes we treat the present, the opportunity you have right now in this chapel service, the opportunity you have at Spring Arbor to become the man or woman that God has created you to be. And sometimes we treat that like a public restroom. Use it for what I need. It's a means to an end. And then let's just not get close to anything, not touch anything, not invest. And let's just get out because the future is what, what it's about. I'm here to, to learn and get, so I can get a job. Let me encourage you to be present and not do that because you'll miss some. The people who are fully present get to see stuff the rest don't while they're looking over the shoulder or checking their phone or whatever they're doing. So that's my first challenge to you is don't be that guy or that gal that someday thinks, man, I, I wasted some opportunities there at Spring Arbor. Here's some important, this is one of my favorite verses. And I, I usually read from the New Living Translation. Uh, this is one of my favorite verses from the Old Testament. Seek the Lord while he, you can find him. Call now while he is near. Isaiah 55, 6. That's one of those carpe diem statements before that saying got cool. The Lord is near now. This, this, is, this is your time. Listen while he's near. Find him where he can be found. Because today isn't like any other day. Matthew 7, 7. Keep asking and you will receive what you ask. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and, you, and the door will be open to you. Keep on, keep on, keep on. That's about the present. That's about being fully present. This is from Jeremiah. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Are you going to look wholeheartedly here? Or is your, your, your eye on, is, it, is this opportunity a means to an end? This chapel service, this time at Spring Arbor. I remember when I was in, 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 in college a hundred years ago and um, we rode horses to class. It was just really primitive. But anyway, um, I remember thinking at one point, okay, I'm, I'm studying because I'm supposed to go into ministry. That's for the future. I'm, uh, uh, you know, I go to the, the, the cafeteria and eat because that's for me. I, I play tennis. That, that was for me. And, uh, you know, all of it was about for me and for my future. And so I said, this, is just, this just doesn't feel right. And that's what led me to what I did for 20 years in youth ministry. I, I found some folks that were in a club called Young Life. And I said, that, that looks like fun. I'll do that. And then, you know, I woke up 20 years yet later and I was still doing that. Be present, be fully present. Also, I want to challenge you to think about your calling. Whenever I say that, people think, well, that's for folks like you, or maybe folks like Quentin. 
That's, that's, that's for other people. That, that's for ministry. That's for full-time ministry. Well, you know, full-time ministry is going to be hard to find in the future. Let me just play Nostradamus for a moment. You know, you're probably going to be getting a little here, a little there, and, and, and it's going to be hard to find, find those full-time positions. But you're going to be creative, and you're going to do ministry wherever you are because you're going to be different than my generation. And I'm excited about that. But what about your calling? So we talk in the terms of our culture of figuring out who I am, looking inside and discerning who I am. Here's, here's a, a, a news flash for you. Maybe it is. Truth is re- revealed. It is not within you. That's what we believe as Christians. That's what we believe when we look at, at God's word. I don't mine truth out of Bill Griner. I don't put on my little miner helmet and go, okay, it's in there somewhere. I'm going to figure out and I'm going to define me. Everybody wants to define me instead of figuring out what am I being called to? What is God calling me to? My calling was to, to go into full-time ministry, but I thought I was going to be a missionary. And here's why, because I was 11 years old. My dad here is here, who's 91 years old, Bob Greiner. And <clears throat> we went to a Sunday night church service, and there was a, a, a missionary there who had slides you have no idea what that means. It was this little thing that light shined through a little square, shakunk, shakunk, and they, never mind, ask your parents or grandparents. So they, they were showing these slides, this missionary stuff, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to over-spiritualize it. It was, it was dry. It was boring. I was doing a Quentin in the front, head snapping back, um, but God spoke to me. I can't explain it. Your calling probably isn't going to be like mine. You know, I, I felt a warm sense all around my body. I didn't hear a voice, but I knew that I knew that I knew. At 11 years old, the guy was calling me to serve him. That my vocation was going to be ministry of some kind. I just assumed I would be a missionary because that's who was talking, or at least I think so. I really wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Guilty by association. That I'm walking around Westland High School in, in Columbus, Ohio, a high school of about 2,000 students. I'm doing what they taught me in young life. I'm going to the, the principal and ask permission to walk around the cafeteria and talk to the students I know and meet their friends. And I'm just doing what I'm doing, and then all of a sudden, it, it's like, that's what he was talking about. Their teachers, they're supposed to be there. Their students, they're supposed to be here. I'm the foreigner. That's what he was talking about. And I did that 20 years until he told me to do something else that I had no interest in doing for those 20 years, and that's being a senior pastor. I had seen what that guy dealt with, and I had to wait part of that. Youth pastor, you can kind of lie in the weeds while the bullets are flying over. I don't want to disillusion anybody. I'm just, you know, I'm not right today. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not even close to right yet. Maybe in a couple of years I'll be right, but we're a little, we'll, we're a little impaired right now. See, now, here's the problem, is, is I'm not going to get, leave my contact information because some, somebody here is going to say, you know what? I heard about calling. God's speaking to me. Maybe you heard about Quentin's calling. He was going to, he was on a trajectory, trajectory to, he wanted to uh, start a nonprofit in, a, in a, a large urban area like Los Angeles for children. He experienced some amazing things at a place uh, through the Center for Student Missions where we went on mission trips to Los Angeles and large cities. And he, he, we were at a place called Las Familias where kids were dropped off where their parents were worked in illegal sweatshops in the, in the Skid Row area of Los Angeles. And he fell in love with those kids and, and we saw that kids responded to him. That was his calling. Uh, somebody's gotta do that. <laughs> Somebody's got to do that. And so I'm not going to leave my, uh, back to not leaving my contact information because so- somebody is going to say, Mom, I'm, uh, Mom, this is Jimmy. I'm not going to be an accountant anymore. I don't even know if you have that here. But, uh, you know, it's a safe thing. Pick something high paying other than social work and, and ministry and teaching, which most of you are going to be. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to be an accountant anymore. There was this guy at this chapel service, and now I'm going to join the Peace Corps. <laughs> Don't call me. It's, blame Quentin. It's his fault. It's not me. <laughs> You've probably heard this verse before, that um, Isaiah is calling in the temple. 
I won't read it all, but um, in one point, he's having this vision that he's in the temple and, you know, seraphim and, or, or, you know, these winged beasts are flying around and he says, I'm a man of unclean lips and an unclean tongue. One of them picks up a coal off of the altar. Um, you know, we didn't have worship bands back then. They, they burnt animals. I know it's a little weird and primitive, but that's what they did. And the, the, they pick up a coal off there and touches his lips. And God speak to, speaks to him. And then God says, who am I going to send? And Isaiah said, send me. That's a calling. It doesn't always get defined at the age you're at. Like I said, I had some, I, I wasn't sure. I, I thought I was going to be a missionary. I, I never dreamed of being a senior pastor. I don't know what you're going to do. But think in terms of calling as opposed to defining who you are. Everybody wants to define who they are. Revelation is from outside of you. It's a gift. It's something that you don't see that is revealed to you in time. This is a great season in your life to think in terms of what God is calling you to. In, in this season in our life, and this is the, another challenge I wanna to make to you is that here at Spring Arbor, if you can view God as a redeeming God, that he can take awful things, take garbage and make something wonderful out of it, that's what we're experiencing. I don't believe that God uh, caused a guy um, to get drunk and run into my son and kill him. I don't believe that was God's plan. I believe God is a redemptive God. He takes that because he gave that guy who he loves the free will to choose because love means you choose. It can't be enforced. He wanted that man to love him and have the opportunity to have, be in a love relationship with him. That man decided to drink and get drunk and, and run into my son and they're both gone. But God is a redemptive God. He takes things and makes something exceptional. I could talk here for an hour of all the things that have happened that because of, of the God taking something bad and making something great out of it. Maybe at, during your time at Spring Arbor, you won't experience something. I, I pray that no one experiences this. You know, lo losing a, a, a son, it, it's a small club and nobody wants to be in that club. And I am. That's the deal. Maybe it won't be anything s traumatic like that. But some of you are going to get your first C. <laughs> I'm just brace yourself. You're going to get your first C. Everybody's been telling you at high school how wonderful you are. And then one of these wonderful professors is going to say to you, I love you, but that's not quite good enough. <laughs> and you're going to freak. Because they call you guys the trophy generation because everybody's been giving you trophies. There's somebody who's going to love you enough to say, you know what, I think you can do better. And that's going to be traumatic. Can God make something good of that? Yes, he can. I remember just burning out my sophomore year. I played tennis. Fall was our tennis season. And I, I, my, my game was, was in, the, in the toilet. Can I say that at Spring Arbor? In the, okay. okay. My game was not good at that point. I didn't feel healthy. I, you know, I was starting to run out of gas. I, I, and I was starting to get sick from, you know, just burning the candle at both ends. Classes weren't going well. I called my dad and I was like, man, I, you know, God did something with that. He turned it around. He spoke to me in my weakness. I mean, it does say, the book does say, his power is made perfect in weakness. Let me tell you what. I know that on a level now that I never knew that before. I mean, I don't want to be this powerful. <laughs> I would like to be weak and have Quentin back, but, but God is making power out of my weakness and then I can't take credit for it. Maybe during this time, maybe it's already happened or maybe you will, maybe you'll make a stupid reckless decision. I hope not, but maybe you will. By the way, I get that. After Quentin's death, I get why people do reckless things, okay? I can feel it like I didn't before. What the heck? I'll do whatever. Don't get worried. I'm not going to. Family, don't get worried. I'm not going to. 
but I get that. Maybe that'll happen to you. Can God make something great out of that? That's about, and we don't talk about this a lot in the church, and we should, that's about seeing the kingdom. That's the ability to see God's gracious authority and rule exploding around us. Signs that his authority and his loving rule is being acknowledged by people. See, we can talk about all the things that are rotten right now, politically, socially, more. We can talk about all that stuff. People who can see the kingdom know that God is a redemptive God. He's going to make something out of garbage. And they are the people, and I hope you will be, who will lean in and say, I'm going to lean into God's word. I'm going to lean into these experiences. And God is going to reveal to me that no matter how bad it looks, the kingdom is moving forward. His loving authority is being acknowledged and that is growing and that is moving forward no matter what anybody tells you. If you can see that in these years in Spring Arbor, that'll be exciting. Because the people that lean in, Jesus talked to all these parables. He told all these parables about the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like. We just got done all summer teaching that in, in our church. I mean, Jesus said the kingdom of God is like, you know, a little yeast in 50 pounds of flour and it makes it rise to dough. You got to lean in to look. You got to lean in to notice. It's not for the people who just need the obvious. You can't be that way, students. You have to be the ones that can. Or the kingdom of God is you know, like a, a mustard seed that's going to grow into a tree that is going to be shelter for birds. Captain Obvious does not see the kingdom. But you can if you lean in. But you have to be fully present to lean in to what God is doing. People who are willing to lean in, listen hard, look intently, will see the loving authority of God spreading. Here's another challenge. Will you think about legacy as opposed to trophy. Again, you've been called the trophy generation. When, when the boys played, had their brief soccer careers. And uh, I remember we were in Alma, Michigan, and, and the season's over, and Quentin gets this, I don't know, he's about this big, uh, he, he gets this medal, and he's so excited, and he looks around. You know what he saw? Everybody else had the same medal. And he was like, I mean, he didn't use these words, but he was like, this is a fraud. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> they're, well, I can't use that phrase, but they're, <laughs> they're encouraging me to believe something that isn't true. If you think in terms, see, a trophy is something I receive for, as recognition for something that I did. A legacy is something completely different. And so you, it's, it's hard to think in legacy at your age. The, the, I'm, you know, odds are I'm closer to seeing Jesus than you are. So, you know, people get more spiritual the older they get because they're closer to the, the finish line. But it's hard to think in legacy. But legacy is what you leave behind for somebody else. It's thinking about somebody else. It's I'm not just here to get mine again used for a means to an end so I can get on to my future and have that great job and that great wife or husband and, and kids and, and a, a nice house. The, people who's, the person who's thinking legacy is saying, yeah, I'm, I'm, something I'm doing right now is building something that somebody else is going to enjoy. Can you be that kind of person? It says, the thing I'm going to get a build, the promised land that, that he saw for the mountain, I'm not even going to be able to enter it, and can you be okay with that? Those are the people that build legacy. We're hearing all kinds of things about Quentin's legacy. Stories that we didn't know of things that happened. The, the young man who, uh, the, the autistic young man who uh, was on the track team at, at Midland High who uh, Quentin helped in the weight room all the time. And then after his death, the, this man is bringing food in. I said, I have to know who this guy is. You know, in my grief, I can figure out, who is this guy coming to my house? And, was Jacob's dad. 
Jacob's dad says to me, if Q was at the weight room, we knew Jacob was going to be okay. And somebody was watching out for him. And he said, I will, we will never forget that. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Quentin was far from, from perfect. But at 20, he left a legacy. What do you want to leave behind? Make the most of the time. Don't waste it. Don't compartmentalize this, these years at, at Spring Arbor as, again, a means to an end. I need to be here. I got to do this so I can get what I want later. Be fully present. Be able to see the kingdom here. And leave a legacy. And God can do amazing things. And here's my other asterisk, and then I need to wrap this up. Is... Um, in your enthusiasm, stay tethered to God's word. I'll say it in the opposite way. If you want to stay the way you are, and you like things as they are, you like the status quo, I beg you, please do not read that book. Please do not lean into that book. Please do not study that book, because it will mess you up in a good way. So stay clear of it. If you like the status quo, Again, I'll probably get, I won't give them my, uh, my information so they won't get bad emails about that comment. But that's, that's how it works. Stay, you got to stay connected to God's word. I want to read one last scripture and it's, Quentin had a, and his buddies had a, you know, a dopey saying called no rules. If you want to look up hashtag no rules. It's not about anarchy. It was about getting out of your comfort zone not doing what the man or everybody else thinks you should do, go and serve. And um, the verse that's on this is 2 Timothy 4, 7, and it, it epitomizes, I think, what we're talking about this morning and the ability to leave a legacy. And I want to read this to you. And this is from the, uh, from the message. You take over. I'm about to die, my life an offering on God's altar. This is the only race worth running. I've run hard right to the finish, believed all the way. All that's left now is the shouting, God's applause. Depend on it. He's an honest judge. He'll do right not only by me, but by everyone eager for his coming. I believe in, in you, for whatever that's worth. I believe in, in your generation. I believe in Spring Arbor University. M my generation, we did the best we could. But in some way, we kind of left you with a mess. We left you with churches with full of people that love God, but they're consumers. They come to church, means to an end, to consume spiritual goods and services that will give them a happy life, and then they can squeak into heaven. You have to do better. I'm sorry, that's the deal. You have to do better. And I believe you will. That you'll come ready to lean in, see the kingdom, leave a legacy, and you'll be there to leave something and not just receive and consume. Because you're more than that. Our culture will tell you you're nothing more than a consumer. You're more than that. You're somebody who is the very temple of the God who is so powerful and big they couldn't even say his name. That's who you are. It says we are SAU. That can be the, the asterisk. We are the residents of the God that was so big and powerful they couldn't get, even say his name. I just wanna pray. I wanna pray for you. You gotta get to class. And that's important. What I'm saying is not more important than your professors are going to say. But um, I want to pray for you. And I want you to think in terms as I'm praying, is God speaking to me about calling, about legacy?
about what he wants for my life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask a blessing upon this student body and, the, and, the, and all the staff and, and, and uh, professors and teachers and everybody, but particularly the students, Father, that during this time, they will be able to be fully present. They will see your kingdom and you will put it on their hearts to leave a legacy. That this time won't be a means to an end. That it will be something where you're going to bust in. You're going to demonstrate your authority, your loving authority, your kingdom in their faces. And right now, across this room, you're probably speaking to somebody and saying, you know what? You may have been thinking about this. I want you to do this. And I love you as you are, but enough not to leave you that way. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, which means let it be done.